It was one of the most elaborate scams in the history of art crime. A devious plan to smuggle precious Egyptian antiquities that fooled customs officers for years. But as the legal net closed around him, the man behind the trade was driven to the point of suicide. I drank hemlock. And I knew that it would kill me within three hours. The case took investigators from the shadows of the pyramids to a quiet English village and right to the heart of New York's Madison Avenue. And it changed the worldwide trade in antiquities forever. In May 1994, the British Museum Egyptology Department received a photograph of a single sheet of papyrus. They were asked to translate the text and verify its origin. Looking closely at the photograph, they immediately realized that they had seen the sheet of papyrus before. They contacted the man who had sent it and asked him if he had any more. He said yes and sent a further 22 photographs to the department. They were now sure that they were dealing with a large theft of Egypt's treasures. The Egyptology department immediately called the police. The call went to Scotland Yard's Art and Antiquities Unit. They in turn called their boss, Dick Ellis. At the time, Dick Ellis was in America working on another case. Ellis had an international reputation as one of the leading investigators of art crime. He took the call from his office about the Egyptian papyrus. Well, it became very apparent to me that the investigation itself um, was, had the potential of being a very big investigation. Dick Ellis returned to London and went to see the experts at the British Museum. The people at the British Museum immediately recognized the papyrus as being part of a uh, number of sheets of papyrus that they had in fact excavated themselves back in the 1960s uh, at Saqqara in Egypt. And they were aware that these were uh, objects which they had recorded and had placed into an Egyptian government store uh, in Saqqara and where they knew that these objects should still be. So they immediately realized that these were stolen these papyrus were written by an animal cult laying out the methods of mummification of animals in Saqqara, near Cairo. Dick Ellis realized that he was embarking on a complicated investigation. If these pieces were stolen, how was this done? And how had they come from an Egyptian government store to reach England? It was the start of an investigation that would change the laws governing cultural heritage in both the United States and in Britain. We were aware and had been for some time of, uh, should we say, the illicit flow of antiquities. It's been a problem for many countries uh, over the last, well, uh, several decades. Um, and it seemed to us that uh, we were looking here at an instance of the mass theft of Egyptian antiquities. Of course, none of this was new. It had been going on for centuries. During the late 19th century, Europeans discovered the wonders of ancient Egyptian art. Archaeologists started digging and recorded their finds. With this passion to record came the passion to collect. Egyptian art began to flow from its home country to the West. As the demand increased, so did looting. Artifacts came out of Egypt in two main ways. Initially, as travelers went to Egypt, they removed objects, say, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, and those were taken back to various private collections and public collections. The other source was through tomb robbing and removal of objects from temples that were taken out of Egypt illegally then sold at auction. Egypt initially made a profit out of selling its national heritage. 
In 1983, this all came to a halt when the Egyptian government passed a law declaring all newly discovered antiquities and those still in the ground to be the property of Egypt. Any removal of antiquities from Egypt was considered theft. 1983 law number 117 uh, was, a, was a good law, but it was not that good. The new act in 1983 should have made a big impact, but all it meant was that it drove the market underground. There were still people digging up objects, and rather than declaring them, tried to pass them through middlemen, and there was a steady stream of objects ending up on the European and North American antiquities market. Without an international law to regulate it, the trade flourished. It was worth a small fortune. The scale of the problem is enormous. To give a single example of one North American auction house, between 1998 and 2006, over $100 million worth of antiquities were sold, of which $35 million worth were Egyptian antiquities. In fact, David Gill estimates that 96% of the Egyptian items had no record of the site they came from. He believes they were simply removed illegally from the country. As Dick Ellis started his investigation, he had one vital piece of information given to him by the British Museum. The name of the man who had claimed to own the papyrus, Andrew May. Ellis discovered that May lived in Devon, a county in southwest England. His home was called Westaway Cottage in the small town of Barnstable. Ellis called a senior detective with the local police to find out more about Andrew May. Ellis was in for a big surprise. There was a colleague of mine in the office took a phone call from Dick Ellis in the antique squad from Scotland Yard. and. Uh, the inquiry was, did we know anything about a man called Andrew May and uh, Westaway Cottage? And Westaway Cottage had been the scene of a burglary uh, reported the previous year in 1993, where a man previously unknown to me called Jonathan Tokley Parry had been the inhabitant of the premises. He'd reported that an Egyptian head had been stolen, uh, which had a value on, on our crime complaint of in excess of £100,000. Ellis knew that this was a remarkable coincidence. He asked Toms to carry on investigating the two men. Toms found out that the apparently mysterious Jonathan Tokley Perry was in fact a former army officer and a Cambridge University graduate. He was also regarded as one of the world's finest antique restorers. He had been a tenant of Andrew May's and had a cottage and a workshop on the grounds of his house. We surmised that there was some uh, at least a conspiracy uh, between the two, Andrew May and his tenant, Jonathan Toki Parry. So we obtained search warrants for Andrew May's house, for the cottage, uh, and the buildings in the grounds of the manor house. On June 28, 1994, Dick Ellis went with an expert from the British Museum to join Steve Toms. They planned to raid Andrew May's stately home. In Jonathan Tokley Parry's workshop, we found that he had both a workshop and an office. Uh, in the office were uh, filing cabinets which we seized, uh, and obviously there were a lot of records there referring to um, pieces that um, had been brought out of Egypt. Um, they referred to people involved in uh, the trade that um, Jonathan Tokley Parry was involved in. They had heard that Tokley Perry had left Westaway a few months earlier. He had now moved to a quiet village a 30 minutes drive away. Police went in search of him. Local people in the village were shocked by the police interest in their newest resident. It was a nice summer's day, the door was wide open. From behind the bar you can see straight across to the cottage where Jonathan lived. And all of a sudden, Eight guys turned up, looking through windows with crowbars in their hands. And I thought, this is a bit odd. 
the alarm went off and I knew they'd actually gained access through breaking in. We started to search the cottage um, and there we found in the um, ground floor sitting room we found Jonathan Totley Perry's photographic record which showed thousands of objects. The detectives continued packaging and documenting their finds, which included letters, photographs, and diary entries. But they were suddenly interrupted. To their surprise, Tokley Perry had just returned home after flying in from his 65th trip to Egypt. Well, when I got back from the airport, um, the door was open for me, and the cottage was full of, of of policemen and customs, about eight of them in fact. They made themselves at home. I had my computer and all my equipment here in those days and they'd just taken the place apart. When I opened the door I thought I'd been burgled again and I was actually quite relieved to find that I hadn't but then I got bloody annoyed because they were here and they were making free with my house. This is where they got in, um, used crowbars to smash the window even though Barry over at the pub had the key. Police had found several pieces of Egyptian art. The most interesting find was some false door panels in Tokli Perry's room. A false door in a tomb is actually a wall built by the ancient Egyptians to give the spirit of the dead a passage to the land of the living. They'd said to me downstairs, what about the antiquity that you've hidden upstairs? And I said, well, actually, there are two of them. You've only found one. When I went away, I stored one of the freezers underneath the bed, which is the one they found, but they actually hadn't bothered to look in, in the drawer where the second one was, so I handed it over. The police officers weren't certain what they'd found. They weren't even sure if what they now had was real, let alone valuable. Dick Ellis asked the British Museum expert to take the objects back to London to study them, but Ellis made a decision. With the wealth of documents, photographs, and objects, he thought he already had enough evidence. He arrested Tokley Perry for the dishonest handling of stolen antiquities. I arrested him there and then, and um, we took him to Barnstable Police Station. He was surprised. I don't think he ever thought that we would convict him of any crime in this country to the point that on the way to Barnstable Police Station he asked us to detour via his mother's house, which he went into and came out and gave us the head of Marriott, a bronze cat, and other items which he had stored in his mother's house. Tokley Perry was confident that his interest in Egyptian antiquities was not breaking any British law. It all started when I got tired of telling one of my customers and he got tired of listening that everything he just brought out of Egypt was fake. And he asked me, would I go with him to Egypt to certify what he bought before he bought it? It was a jolly for me. It ended in disaster, but it took me down to Egypt for the first time and I caught the magic of it. When I first went to Egypt, I was aware that I was breaking Law 117 of 1983, Egyptian law, whereby Egypt nationalised all her antiquity and claimed every piece in the soil, unfound or found, as national property. At first I thought it was just a game, it was fun. But as I began to understand the extent of the corruption and of destruction, the sheer nonsense of this law, I thought that not only was it the correct thing for me to do but it was morally correct and I began to believe and still do that a lot of these antiquities had I not brought them out would have been destroyed so I have no moral qualms about it whatsoever. At the time police were not sure if they had sufficient evidence to charge Tokley Perry with any offense but as they continued their investigation into the case another local man came into the frame. There's a man called Mark Perry. Uh, we'd received some information that Mark was making frequent trips to Egypt uh, uh, on, 
on, at the weekends, flying out on a Friday, returning on a Sunday. And then he was banking cash sums of money on the Monday morning, which was completely out of character. So what had Perry been up to in Egypt? Perry was a local handyman who lived across the road from Andrew May's house. Dick Ellis was suspicious. The following morning, we went uh, and called on Mark Perry uh, and interviewed him. Um, and again, that was another uh, key part to the investigation because Mark Perry um, was, until almost his last trip to Egypt, unaware of Egyptian law. He was unaware of, uh, therefore, any breaches of the United Kingdom law that he may have been making. The first I knew of it was when my door came come, uh, caved in with the, the police from Barnstable Police Station and New Scotland Yard officers came in and that was the first I realised that the depth or the severity of the trouble I was in at the time. All the time we were doing it, in that 12, 18 month span, I'd never thought I was breaking the law. I didn't comprehend the severity of it. And of course, I just said, I've not broken any laws. You know, what, what, what do you want to know? I tell you, I've not broken a law. But Ellis got some vital information about the smuggling operation from Perry. He discovered that Tokli Perry had partners in Egypt. His main contact was called Ali Farag. I was introduced to Ali Farag by my then supplier who was a rogue, a rascal, and had been cheating me. And Ali Farag, I think he wanted to make contact with the West. He wanted to find somebody that he could trust and could work with. He saw what his older brothers were doing. They were the leading dealers in Egypt, very powerful men. And he wanted to be like them. And he saw me, a young man, also hopeful, also wanting to find wonderful things and to get them out, and we just clicked. The problem for Ellis was that he didn't yet know what Tokli Perry and Farag had been smuggling. He then received a call from the expert at the British Museum. He invited me to come up to the British Museum where he'd got something to tell me, so I went up there and um, went into his office where he opened the book the definitive tome on the tomb of Hetep Kar. And he explained to me that having looked at the style of the uh, these wall pieces that we'd found under the bed, um, he'd identified them as Old Kingdom. He had looked closely at, uh, obviously, the objects. Uh, he was not happy with the hieroglyphs that appeared on them, um, but nonetheless researched them, and he had found that they were from the tomb of Hetep Ka. Hetep Ka was a statesman and a royal hairdresser, the Vidal Sassoon of the pharaohs. The tomb had remained undisturbed for thousands of years until discovered in the 1960s. It was panels from Hetep Ka's tomb that had been found by police under Tokli Perry's bed. They now knew they had a theft, but they had no reports of this theft. Without this, they had no case. They did not have enough evidence to convict anyone under British law. They needed to secure the cooperation of the Egyptian authorities. We took a fairly unusual step and we invited the Egyptian ambassador in London to come to Scotland Yard for a briefing on what we had found and where our investigation had got to. Under Egyptian law, certain families were granted the right to hold collections of antiquities, but not to sell them. The Faregs had one of these listed collections. Now, with growing evidence of widespread looting, the Egyptian authorities were prepared to act. It was a breakthrough. They opened up their records for Ellis to inspect. They brought with them a vast book. The size of it was amazing. It came in a suitcase on its own and it was the record of the licensed collection that the Farag family had under its control. And we sat down with them and went through this page by page and compared objects in that to objects or photographs of objects that we'd seized from Tokli Parry. And we were able to identify a number of pieces. 
from that specific collection. But it wasn't entirely clear what Tokli Perry was up to. Ellis needed to go to Egypt to find out for himself. The Egyptians uh, regarded our visit to, uh, to Egypt as, as both significant but also risky. They were also concerned for our safety because clearly there was quite a lot at stake as far as individuals in Egypt were concerned. They therefore asked us uh, under the guise of visiting Egypt to look at the security of various sites of antiquity. But soon news spread about their true intentions. So it was of some concern to both them and us when on the very first day that they went out and made a, an inspection of a, of a collection, they found in the Farrag's house a business card. And on the back of the business card was written my name, the name of my associate Tony Russell, and of our interpreter who'd come with us. So the Farags were being tipped off as to the fact that we were there. And clearly they knew now that uh, this was an investigation that they were going to have problems stopping, but nonetheless one which they would try to. Ellis and his group left Cairo for Saqqara, the city of the dead. Saqqara was a necropolis, a vast burial ground for the ancient city of Memphis. It was also where the papyrus offered to the British Museum in May 1994 had come from. On November 19th, Dick Ellis went to see the tomb of Hetep Ka in the shadow of the oldest pyramid at Saqqara. It was just 60 yards from a guard post manned 24 hours a day. We got there about four o'clock in the afternoon to be greeted by the superintendent of the site who told us that uh, we wouldn't be able to get into the tomb. So guessing that he was playing for time, uh, we said that wasn't a problem, that we'd go out there and we'd clear the sand ourselves. This is the entrance to the tomb just below ground level. So you're looking here at this point of the plan. This is the entrance. And in the background to that, very short distance away is the step pyramid, the oldest pyramid in Egypt. The steel door that uh, had been placed over the entrance uh, still bore its, its seals from the uh, antiquity department inspectors and the padlock and everything were in place to give the appearance, at any rate, the tomb was intact. What the criminals had done was to excavate away the sand at the side of the tomb and entered through the side wall. They'd actually removed the stones which had been placed there to protect it. When you see how close the tomb was to one of these manned security posts, you begin to understand the complicity that existed with the staff. Going back to the tomb itself, uh, entering through here, you walk down this long corridor, and on each side of the corridor, this wonderful limestone relief, um, which have been drawn in these plans to show the uh, various uh, life activities uh, of Hetep Car. So you get a picture of this man's life as you walk down the corridor to this area, which is the chapel. And across here, this whole section was the full store from ground to roof. We were confronted with literally a pile of rubble. Uh, and it very, very dramatically brought home to us what the illicit trade in cultural property does to countries like Egypt and does to countries like Britain as well. When you have ancient sites which are destroyed uh, illegally and for personal financial gain. Ellis discovered that in December 1991, the tomb had been broken into from the roof. He also claims that records showed that Tokli Perry had visited Egypt in December 1991 and January 1992. Everything was falling into place. What's more, Ellis was beginning to unravel precisely how Tokli Perry was disguising his stolen antiquities. If you compare the line drawing to the photographs that were taken of the two sections that we found under Tokli's bed in his cottage, you see immediately that, that some of these pieces have been altered to try and disguise them. You'll notice that here the hand is clenched and clutching some ceremonial cloth. In Tokli's version, what he's done as, as a restorer is he has altered it to make the hand open and to make the cloth disappear. And most importantly, Across the top of these, almost above the, the head of the figure, were the remnants of 
um, the hieroglyph. And this hieroglyph, which appears on each of these pieces, actually spells his name. So any remnant of that would immediately tell an Egyptologist able to read hieroglyphs, Hetep Kar. And for that reason, Tokli Parry has taken those out and replaced them with some fictitious hieroglyph meaning nothing. Alice returned to England, but there was a missing final link in Tokli Parry's smuggling chain. Alice suspected he knew what it was. In among Tokli Perry's papers, there were many correspondence between him and a respected New York antiques dealer, Fred Schultz. Fred Schultz had become head of the leading trade group, the National Association of Dealers in Ancient, Oriental, and Primitive Art. He had even advised President Clinton about the antiquities trade. One leading archaeologist who had met Fred Schultz in the early 1980s was Dr. Betsy Bryan. When I first met uh, Fred Schultz, he was uh, quite young. And um, in, in New York, he um, was opening his own gallery, which he ran right out of his own apartment. Uh, he was a very attractive young man and uh, really easy to talk to. It was hard not to like uh, Fred Schultz, uh, I would have to say. In fact, Ellis had already made contact with Schultz. A few weeks after the raid of Tokley Perry's cottage, Ellis received a call from him out of the blue. Fred Schultz was on the telephone from New York saying that um, I had this piece, I'd seized it from uh, Tokley Perry. It was a piece that he had bought in New York that he had sent to Tokley Perry for restoration and could he have it back please? Uh, the simple answer was no. Dick Ellis asked him for documentary proof that the piece was his. Schultz provided him a receipt, which showed he had bought it from another dealer for $25,000. Ellis got on a plane to New York. His first stop was to meet with Joseph Garena, the dealer who had provided Fred Schultz with the receipt. I went first with an FBI agent to Garena. Uh, we cold called him and I confronted him with this receipt and just simply said, is this your receipt? Yep, he said. And I said, did you ever sell that object to Schultz? And he realized the seriousness of what he'd done and he just said, no, never did. Never had the piece, never saw the piece. Only gave Schultz the receipt because he asked for it. And he asked for it to cover his tracks. And I did something that we do in this country, they don't do in the States. I took a written statement from him there and then, which he signed. And within a matter of hours, he was trying to uh, retract the statement, having spoken to Schultz and to Schultz's lawyers. But we had it in writing, signed by him, that he had done this uh, and the reasons why he had done it, uh, and he couldn't retract. Ellis then went to Schultz's art gallery on Manhattan's Madison Avenue. We then co called Schultz, who was not, shall we say, welcoming. I agreed that he could have his lawyer present, I spoke to his lawyer on the telephone and we arranged a meeting the following day at which only the lawyer showed up, Schultz didn't show. Ellis returned to London more convinced than ever that the high-profile American dealer was a key player in the Egyptian smuggling ring. But he had no idea of the huge scale of the operation and least of all, the breathtaking skill with which it had been carried out. Tokli Perry realized as early as 1987 that there was a profit to be made from procuring and exporting Egyptian antiquities to the West. Getting hold of good pieces would be difficult, so he relied on Ali Farag to find him the very best objects. The objects that we exported were mostly brought to us. The Farags had a shop in Cairo and it was well known throughout Egypt that this was the place to bring antiquities that the fellahin, the farmers, had found in their fields. So, although the shop was watched during the day by the antiquities police, they would knock off at 11 o'clock at night, and if they were a little late, they'd let us know. 
and as soon as they knocked off, the shop would open and all through the night people would come in. But how to get all this stuff out of Egypt? Tukli Perry used Mark Perry as one of his couriers to bring antiquities through customs and into England. We used to pay customs officers to carry our suitcases through the customs and they'd carry this suitcase dragging it through with probably 40 kilos in there. <laughs> By 1987, Tokli Perry and Ali Farag had bigger treasures in their sights. What Tokli refers to as the great game. A game to find the most beautiful artifacts or to make lots of money, or as it turned out, both. The game involved an elaborate and audacious scam. In the early period, I carried things naked. I carried antiquities in my luggage. And it was clear that sooner or later I would be discovered. It was Ali himself who had the idea of disguising them as tourist trophies. And the standard technique that we developed was to coat them with a conservation plastic and then gild them and then paint them just as if they were vulgar kitsch tourist pieces. So that if the customs opened my suitcase, they would see the usual rubbish that tourists buy. And it worked very well. After preparing the piece for export, they would then buy a similar object from a tourist shop and keep the receipt. Tokli Perry would give this to customs officials. As soon as the pieces were back in England, I would immerse them in a container of pure solvent, acetone, which would dissolve the conservation plastic and everything else that I put on, plaster or filling, would just float off, leaving the antiquities exactly as I'd found them, and also cleaned. And then, if necessary, I would restore them. It was a safe and reliable method which protected them in transport. In 1991, Tokli Perry and Farag finally hit the jackpot. Ali and I had always been hoping to find a great thing, a world-class piece something that would finish what we call the great game. Eventually we found it, and it was the head of Amenhotep III. Amenhotep III ruled Egypt between 1386 BC and 1349 BC, making the head nearly 3,500 years old. But Amenhotep III also um, was uh, a man who lived in an extremely interesting time period. I mean, not only did he inherit this enormous empire, but he, um, he lived at a time where his family produced all sorts of uh, very famous uh, people. And for example, he was the father of a king who's known from ancient Egypt as the greatest heretic that they ever had. That was Akhenaten. He is believed to have been Tutankhamun's grandfather. Amenhotep III, A3, caught us by surprise. We didn't expect a wonderful thing to arrive so soon. It was the Gulf War that changed everything. During the Gulf War, the Egyptians were very frightened. Everybody was trying to get hard currency and everybody was producing antiquities that they had in storage as rain checks and trying to sell them. And although I could not travel, Ali was going out every night to follow leads, and a builder came to him saying that he had discovered this head on his building plot. He dug it up and he said under ordinary circumstances, because of the laws, he would have concreted it in. It would have been too dangerous. But if we could give him enough money to fly his entire family to Tunisia for the duration, then he would just sell it to us. And we gave him $6,000, which was an extraordinarily low price. And he got his family to Tunisia, and we had the head. The extraordinary head had been unearthed from a town several hours' drive from Cairo. When I first saw the head, I knew that it was something more than I'd ever seen before. And I thought, well, perhaps this is it. Perhaps I can sell this for $50,000. As I began to know it, it seemed more and more wonderful. 
but I had no idea of really what it was and how important it was. I just thought, Christ, I've got to get this out of the country. That was my concern. This is roughly speaking what I took to the airport that morning. The head of Amenhotep III with a false nose because A3's nose is killed, chopped off. The beard made up, the rear socket filled in, gilded, painted to make, as, make it look as vulgar as possible. And with a false bottom, an entire new section added along here in plaster with the word Semiramis written which is the hotel from which I bought the copy and from which I had the receipt. This was specifically put there for the customs official to scratch. And sure enough, when they opened up my suitcase, the first thing he wanted to know was why is it so heavy? Because it weighs 100 pounds and the plaster one should only weigh 15 pounds. I said, oh, I think, I put, I think they put stone inside. He then got out his keys and was about to scratch there. That would have been disastrous for me because there's only a millimetre between the gilding and the stone. If he'd discovered the stone, I would have been in prison within half an hour. I had to get him from there to there. And I had to do that by using what the military call the voice of command. And as he was going to that, I said, no, 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 not there. Down there, please. It's plaster. And he did, without thinking. And he went down there and scratched and found that it was plaster, and then just lost interest and walked away. Tokley Perry successfully brought the head to England. Now he needed to find a partner who could sell the magnificent head for him. He was a restorer, not a dealer, and did not have the right contacts. My first task was to try and work out what this wonderful head was worth. And there hadn't been any such object sold through the rooms for the previous 20 years. Uh, there was no other way for me to find out other than by getting the information from a dealer. So I thought I'd play a little game. I took photographs of a lot of heads in museums around the world, and then I photographed a photograph of my head of Amenhotep III, so I had, as it were, a collection of photographs, all in the same format, with the Joker in the pack. And my idea was to give this pack to a dealer and just watch his reaction, and without letting him know that I owned it, find out how much he would pay for it. And I gave the pack of photographs to Fred Schultz. He went through them, he said, oh, this is wonderful, this is in Cairo, this is in the Met, isn't it wonderful? And then he reached my photograph and he said, what's this? I ought to know this, it's wonderful. And I said, oh, that's mine. I brought it out last month. And literally within 10 minutes, he'd gone into a bureau de change and he'd taken out 10,000 pounds English and he'd given me the money so he would have first refusal to deal with my head. So I thought, seems a nice enough chap. And that was how it started. Tokley Perry thought he could easily sell it for $50,000. But then Fred Schultz valued it at $2 million, a sum Tokley Perry had never dared dream of. He had found in Schultz the partner he had longed for, a well-connected and ambitious man. The two men faced one obstacle, Dealers would only buy pieces if they knew their provenance, a history of ownership. So they came up with a story, giving the head a false provenance, a false history. It was a story that even duped leading archaeologists. Schultz wanted to get a picture of the head published in a respected catalog. This would give the piece prestige and make it easier to sell. He knew someone who was about to publish just such an exhibition catalog. Well, when I first saw the head, I was extremely excited um, because it represented a particular type of, of statue that was unusual, but was almost characteristic of this reign of Amenhotep III it, because it was a life-sized head. In this particular case, we know he had done this in his funerary temple in Luxor, on the west side of Luxor, but he never used 
this particular stone. This meant that there was another temple someplace in Egypt, and so I was extremely excited and wanted to know where it was. Fred Schultz had expected this question. He and Jonathan Tokley Perry had already created a fake historical collection that was almost beyond question. The reason for old collection provenances are simple. If Fred had said that he had A3 from a European dealer, Europe is a large place, but half an hour would have located that dealer. It's a very small market. If Fred had said that it came from a European collector who did not want to deal with anybody else other than Fred, this is an unseen cast of thousands. And an old collection is even better because it means that the piece has been out of Egypt since long before there could be any legal squabble about it. So I created a 1920s collection, which was actually rather tremendous fun. I made up the labels and I patinated them. And I luckily had an uncle called Thomas Alcock, who was a colonial engineer who had spent his life going up, up and down the, the Suez Canal and was the ideal person to have had such a collection. The story that, uh, that Fred Schultz uh, gave me uh, about this uh, Alcock collection um, had the ring of truth to it. Because yes, there were a number of cases where, especially families um, from England, collected pieces while they were in the military, or even earlier in the 19th century. And so it was a story that had all sorts of reasons that it might be believed. Betsy Bryan asked for further verification, but didn't get any. I asked Fred whether the family would agree to our publishing the one photograph that we did have uh, in, in the exhibition catalog. And um, that's what we did. For more than a year, uh, I still labored believing that it was the head from the Alcock collection. In 1993, Fred Schultz was able to sell the head of Amenhotep to a British art dealer for $1.4 million, and Jonathan Tokley Perry had his big payday. It was a year later that the pages of the papyrus turned up at the British Museum, and Scotland Yard started out on the trail of Jonathan Tokley Perry. Betsy Bryan knew nothing of this investigation, but the next time she visited London, she was in for a big shock. I visited the British Museum and was asked by one of my colleagues to come into his office. And when I did, he handed me a photograph of this head. And he said, do you know this head? And I said, of course I do. I published that head in the catalog last year. And he said, um, I think maybe you want to sit down before I tell you what I'm going to tell you. And uh, he then pulled out the set of uh, Polaroids that showed the head in its prior existence when it had had gold paint all over it. I was so angry and uh, really very hurt because I had known Fred, not really, really well, but I had known him for years and years. Um, and uh, to have been so baldly lied to, um, and I guess my pride was deeply hurt. <laughs> the trial of Jonathan Tokley Perry began in central London. He was charged with dishonestly handling stolen goods. Tokley Perry was still convinced he had broken no English law. I contacted my barrister, who said to me that they had made a mistake. I was not breaking English law and could not be breaking English law. It's not even a customs offence. And she said to me, just don't upset them because they'll realise that they made a mistake and they'll drop the whole thing. A lot was at stake, not only for Tokley Perry, but also for the antiquities market. Dealers knew that if the police were successful in getting a conviction, it would set a precedent in British law that would change the art market for good. Mark Perry was the key witness. In court, he gave damning evidence detailing how he smuggled into Britain 
the doors of Hetep Ka. I can remember covering them, and I, I can remember painting in the hieroglyphics, and I can remember painting in the pictures, in in a, in a black paint, gold leaf in it, and then painting it again and whatever, and then writing something stupid on there like "Welcome to Egypt" or whatever it was. We took it, <laughs> took it through the customs, uh, got it back to the UK, and I remember um, Totally Parry actually unwrapping it and putting it into a bath of acetone and it just lifted everything off it. and it was a fantastic transformation really because it went back to the original stone. Together with the photographic evidence of the destruction of the tomb, Perry's evidence was devastating. Hetep Car was a mistake I made. There were six pieces, I bought two and from their condition at the time I thought that they had been in an old collection, that is to say they had been cut off probably before the war and so therefore were quite safe and morally safe to handle. I was wrong. As the final verdict approached, there was a dramatic twist to the story. Tokley Perry was convinced that he was a victim of what he called a political trial. And at that point I think I finally understood what they'd been telling me that I was going to be convicted to create a precedent. And I think that was when I just finally lost my temper about the whole thing. In despair, Tokley Perry admitted himself to Barnstable Hospital and attempted suicide. I checked myself into a psychiatric ward. to be assessed as to whether I was fit enough to continue trial, and I decided that I was not prepared to be bounced in public ceremony, humiliated, just so these buggers could actually change the law and manipulate. And I drank hemlock. And I knew that it would kill me within three hours. Tokley Perry could hardly have chosen a more dramatic exit. Hemlock was used in ancient Greece to poison condemned prisoners. The most famous victim was the philosopher Socrates, a fact that was probably not lost on the philosophy graduate, Tokley Perry. Then, the best laid plans of mice and men, farce. The police turned up at a psychiatric ward and insisted on taking me down to the police station to change my bail. It was pointed out to them that this was against all the rules. I said to them, um, I have taken medication, will you please be as quickly as possible? Uh, but by the time they got me back, they were dragging me. I couldn't walk. So they took me into intensive care. And I didn't think there was any possible antidote. And I was very, very unhappy and angry boy when I woke up. With Tokley Perry in a state of temporary paralysis brought on by the hemlock, the trial collapsed. Meanwhile, his accomplices in Egypt were facing an even worse fate. Ali Farag was charged with being part of a smuggling ring and was sentenced to 15 years hard labor. By comparison, Tokley Perry got off lightly. In the summer of 1997, a second trial took place in London. This time, the trial passed uneventfully, and on June 18, 1997, he was sentenced to six years in prison. The judge in sentencing Tokley um, actually stated that, you know, in the view of the court, this was a serious crime for which not only should Tokley be punished, but also that it had to be an example to other people. But that wasn't the end of the story. The FBI now wanted to take action against Fred Schultz for his role in the crime. Stolen property statutes, they're five year statute of limitations. So the clock was ticking in essence. When I got it, there was already the clock was ticking on if you were gonna move forward with this case, you had to find a violation, you had to find a violation that um, was chargeable within the statute of limitations and move from there. Um, so uh, it was already far along as far as the life of this case. 
um, and um, I had to, to act quickly. Investigators had all of Tokley Perry's diaries and the correspondence with Schultz. What we got here are some of the letters that, uh, copies of the letters that we found when we searched Tokley Perry's house and his workshop. And when you read them, you can see, again, the knowledge that uh, Schultz had that what he was dealing in was stolen material. Uh, for instance, this one, Dear Fred, um, what a year was 1991. Two major pieces and an also ran. Now that Ali and I seem to be making fewer blunders, they know that these are stolen pieces. He's referring there to the head of Amenhotep III, you know, major piece. I'm looking forward to 1992. As you say, when we aren't playing bankers and insurance salesmen, it really is fun, this great game. Have you read Kipling's Kim? As Agent Gildea started his investigation, it was clear who was bankrolling Tokley Perry's smuggling ventures. I thought that the key to this was to, uh, to pay a visit to Mr. Tokley Perry. I thought that uh, Jonathan Tokley Perry would be the ideal person to, to take everyone through from start to finish the whole conspiracy, the operation, uh, along with the correspondence between him and himself and Mr. Schultz. Um, he'd be the perfect person to tell the story, and uh, what better soapbox than uh, New York City, um, you know, media capital of the world, if you will. Um, the hard part was convincing Mr. Tokley Perry. Gildea first interviewed Tokley Perry in prison in 1999, a year before he completed his sentence. When Tokley Perry left prison, the FBI persuaded him to give evidence against Schultz. With his help, Fred Schultz was arrested and charged with conspiring to smuggle stolen goods. Tokley Perry became the star witness. Well, I think he showed uh, this conspiracy in effect, uh, the operation, this smuggling operation uh, that he was involved in. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote these things down, so through his correspondence, through both his, his position in this and, and through Mr. Schultz's position in New York, it just it all came together, obviously, that this was, a, it was an illicit operation. It was illegal, um, and um, um, Mr. Tokley spelled it out, generally through his correspondence. These letters showed, in fact, that this was going on, and, and uh, well after the, the, the laws were enacted. With the help of Tokley Perry's testimony, and especially details of their correspondence, Schultz was convicted. He was sentenced to 33 months prison and fined $55,000. The ring had finally been cracked. This really demonstrated to the antiquities trade that they were now suddenly vulnerable to criminal prosecutions and to the penalties that that imposed which, as was the case with Schultz and Tokley Parry, meant imprisonment. Um, and they were suddenly vulnerable to criminal prosecutions within their own jurisdiction, within their own home territory, as it were. More than a decade after Dick Ellis started his investigations into the theft of the papyrus, Egypt is still fighting the battle against smugglers. The illegal trade in Egyptian antiquities continues, despite the convictions in U.S. and British courts, convictions that Tokley Perry still believes were unjust and politically motivated. Both countries needed some fall guy where the precedent could be established to change the law. I think Fred and myself have grounds to be extremely angry. Jonathan Tokley Perry was reported to have smuggled more than 2,000 pieces of Egyptian art. Most have since been returned to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Still angered by the destruction of Hetep Ka, Ellis continues his crusade against antique traffickers. That is what this trafficking is all about. It's about enabling uh, a relatively few people to get extremely rich off the proceeds of another country's cultural heritage. And it's a heritage which if you went to Egypt and you wanted to see, I'm afraid it's too late. Uh, you've missed the tomb of Hetep Khan. <laughs> <laughs>